Hello and welcome to today's event. My name is Jack and I'll be reviewing a few technical items before we get started. First, we'd like to take a minute before today's discussion begins to review Urban Green's organizational values. Urban Green uses these organizational values to guide our work and as a part of our commitment to fostering inclusive and respectful dialogue. We ask that all meeting participants remain mindful of these values during our discussion. Thank you. If you're having any technical difficulties during the discussion, please email contact at urbangreencouncil.org and we will try to get you sorted as quickly as possible. Finally, if you'd like to submit questions during the session, please do so via the Slido box below your video screen. You can upvote any questions and we will try to answer as many as possible during the second half of today's discussion. Alternatively, you can access Slido on your phone by visiting slido.com and entering the code UGC. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to today's moderator, John Mandike. Thank you, Jack, and good morning and good afternoon to everybody. We have folks joining us from, from Europe uh, today for our program. We're thrilled that you joined us today. My name is John Mandike. I'm the CEO of Urban Green. You may notice that things look a little bit different here at Urban Green uh, because that's we're joining you from a brand new studio Urban Green today at our lower Manhattan office. This is an exciting day for us. I hope you'll like the enhanced experience. We're in the office and many of you are too. In January, commercial occupancy in New York City, New York City was just 10%. Today that's doubled to 20% and rapidly increasing as offices reopen. So this is a perfect time to have the discussion that we plan for you today. We're going to review best practices for health and safety as offices reopen with a global panel of experts. So I'm thrilled to welcome to the program today Chris McHugh from AKF, Catherine Bobenhausen from Colden Corporation, Paul Rohde from Tishman Spire, and Federico Garcia Parra from Otis Elevator Company. Thank you very much for joining our program. I know it's going to be a fascinating discussion. So let's get right into it. Our first speaker today is Chris McHugh. He is a partner with AKF, and he's going to share with us his views on office reopening, particularly from a ventilation standpoint. Chris, take it away. Morning. Hi. Um, as John said, I'm Chris McHugh. I'm a partner at AKF. We're a full service MVP, uh, fire protection engineering firm, and we've been doing a lot of these studies through time. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to get my screen to move. Um, so I'm going to be talking about HVAC ventilation um, and considerations for reoccupancy. Uh, through the course of COVID and even at the beginning, people were talking to us about how, how do I reoccupy? What do I do to assess my HVAC systems, my ventilation systems? What information can I rely on? There was so much information out there. So um, I put together an approach that we've been using for clients to, to kind of go through um, systems and, and taking a look at things from a, a, an overview standpoint before you drill down. So I would say, you know, the, the, the way we really start this is what, what systems were operating, uh, you know, have they not been operating since the start of the pandemic? Have they been operating with partial occupancy? Has any upgrades been taking place? And, and are the systems in your control? Um, and, and work, this will guide the approach, and we've been using this kind of as a roadmap to um, work through things. Um, we start with um, looking at what's there. We take an inventory, um, pretty standard stuff, um, and try to take a look at what actually is installed. Is there energy recovery installed? Is there demand, uh, demand control ventilation installed? Um, have the filters been replaced um, and upgraded over the years? Some, some facilities have just been upgrading filters because of, um, you know, things like compliance with LEED. Um, and then, and then um, ha have any UV lights been retrofitted in the systems um, from the beginning of COVID or, 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 or like in the, pa in the past? Um, they've, UV has typically been used to like keep cooling coils clean and, you know, pre-pandemic times. Um, th then we, we drill down a little further and take a look at um, uh, fil like well, what kind of filters can we actually get in the units. Um, we look at the types of systems and whether there's integral ventilation or not. We normally split up the interior systems from the perimeter systems and office spaces. Um, you know, if you have supplemental air conditioning units, they may have an outside air connection or not. Um, 
Fan coils typically do not have an outside air connection, and that's important because is the unit just recirculating, or is it actually bringing outside air in and mixing it and creating some impact to the space for the outside air? What is the percent outside air that the facility currently is being provided with? Um, does the system have economizer capability to be able to bring in more outside air when it the, the you know when it's tempered out? Um, certainly not in the summer. At least we're based in New York and in summer in New York conditions or the dead of winter. But during the shoulder seasons, you can bring in a lot more outside air up to 100% if the systems are set up with economizer. Um, Air changes have become the benchmark of the way everybody looks at how much ventilation is being moved through spaces. I have a, on the slide, I talk about the formula, but we really want to look at where the air changes are coming from, what systems are providing the air changes. We typically split up the perimeter and the interior systems to really take a look. Standard office spaces have proved out to be between six and air, eight air changes. Um, and. Um, Looking at the upgrades, typically you can upgrade standard units, larger air handling units to MERV-13, which is what's recommended. However, the MERV-13 filters have an impact upon the system static pressure. They have a larger pressure loss than standard MERV-8 filters, which might have been in play before that. So you really need to take a look at the pressure loss to the filters and what the system can handle. Um, and, and, and take a look, there are some enhanced filter technologies that you could use to simulate MERV-13, and there's some manufacturers use have some MERV-13 filters that have electrostatically charged, and they have a lower pressure drop similar to the MERV-8 filters that might be installed in the systems. Local filters, we've applied this in a lot of different areas, and I'll get to that a little further. Um, similar to the picture on the screen, they're recirculating, they typically have HEPA filters, and, um, and they will have UV internal. Um, we've looked at adding UV into systems, larger air handlers, typically it's easier to add UV, but we have looked at and have done retrofits on smaller supplemental air conditioning units. Um, it requires some reconfiguration. You have to be really careful with UV though, because um, anything exposed to the light degrades, the plastics, the wiring, things like that. So when you're putting them into systems, you have to have the manufacturers. All the major manufacturers really understand this and what can do an evaluation for you. Um, adding UV out in the space has other constraints and you want to make sure that all the safety measures and the interlocks are there. We typically don't recommend that. Um, some people are looking at upper room UV and um, things to that effect and they really need to be approached very carefully and a lot of the UV manufacturers are up to speed with these things. Um, looking at the operating sequence for the systems that are installed, um, ASHRAE has um, gotten to a point where they talk about three air changes post, pre and post flush out and normally we'll do a calculation to figure out how many air changes are the space and how long it's going to take you to ramp up to get for occupancy and then to actually clean the space afterwards um, as a flush out. Should you be operating economizer? Um, do they operate economizer? Demand control ventilation should typically be disabled because you want demand control ventilation limits the amount of airflow being delivered to the space based on occupancy. Um, and you, in these times, you want to deliver the, made, you know, the maximum amount of airflow the system can deliver at any given time. Energy recovery presents some issues if there's energy recovery systems installed. Um, the wheel type systems have carryover, and I have a diagram here. You want you need to look at the systems to make sure that the carryover is occurring from the clean outdoor air to the exhaust air, and not vice versa. And that that's a check on how the how the fans are set up. Um, wheel systems, uh, plate plate frame um, energy recovery systems are are better because they actually have totally separated air streams, uh, but the carryover is a lot less. Um, then we have moved on to looking at the facility, the occupancy density. Typically during COVID, you're going to be at a reduced occupancy for what the system was designed to. So you will have a greater percentage of outside air. The workstation partitions become play, um, you know, and, and separation, the height of the partitions and whether they're creating the psychological separation that people would like. Um, elevator lobbies, uh, you know, looking at the density of queuing up, how many people can be in an elevator. Our building, which you're seeing our lobby um, here um, downtown, has um, a limit of four person, four people per elevator, and the signs all over the place. Um, 
you need to take a look at high density spaces, pantries, lunch rooms, meeting rooms for basically either limiting the occupancy going in, directing people to one or the other and providing local filtering. We find that that, that really has worked well. Um, toilet rooms, toilet systems should be running 24 seven, 365. You can also look at local filtering and, and embracing local filter in there. Um, and also the partition heights. Um, perimeter offices, people like going in their offices and closing the door. We've recommended leaving all the doors open, providing local filtering if needed, because a lot of the a lot of the old office building stock in New York has things called induction units at the perimeter that have ventilation, but the amount of air changes may be less than a larger um, central interior system. So we've talked about doing that, preparing um, a local, you know, local filters in certain areas, so maybe higher density offices and leaving the doors open. Um, and preparation and future considerations. Um, I'm sure Catherine's gonna talk about this later on. Stuff like signage, masks, you know, uh, directional, you know, uh, where you want people to congregate, where you don't want them to congregate, things like that all need to be looked at for this. And it folds into how the HVAC systems work in the facility to create the amount of air changes. Um, if you, uh, the, the, the previous slides were all dealt with if you are in control of your system. Here is if you're not in control of your system, and you want to ask your landlord some some questions. I, I have I put together some slides. You know, were the system shut down? Did they do any restart procedures? Did they clean the cooling coils? Did they disinfect the, the hot water systems? Uh, did they change the filters? How much outside air uh, is being provided to your space? What is the outside air? Uh, you know, is it being filtered? The filter rating, all all are things that you can ask your landlord, and they should be willing to um, provide you some information. Are UV and systems installed? If there's a demand control ventilation system that's installed, it should be disabled. Are they running economizer? So, uh, you know, and then even the flush outs, you know, you ask them if they're doing flush outs and then are there any energy recovery devices installed? Um, we've also found that it's good to do some kind of feedback loop um, on some clients we have that have occupied at smaller um, volumes of um, people but we've talked about taking a look at the effectiveness of enacted measures. You may limit people from certain areas uh, because you think that they're gonna be too dense or too occupied and there's not enough air changes. That may change depending upon what group is in and what floors are being occupied. Um, we have a multi-tenant client that has cut off his pantries and two or three of their floors and have directed people to go to one of the floors where they put air cleaners in. Um, Staff survey, we've undertaken a staff survey. We've done staff surveys for clients where you ask them about their preferences. Do they feel like the, there's an air movement in the space, things like that. And uh, it gets tricky because it's almost like if you ask someone a question, um, they're gonna, they, they, may, they may have a problem where it's not a problem, but the surveys can be crafted so that you can get valuable information from people about how their, con their comfort level and how they wanna use the space. The ongoing regulations um, are posted all over the place. There's uh, federal, city, state websites, and the changing guidelines. A lot of the guidelines are changing these days. Uh, the mass mandates are coming down, and um, I just we have uh, someone internally that keeps track of that, and I would I would recommend that you have someone appointed to do that. Um, then um, I put together a master link from ASHRAE on some great resources. ASHRAE's been on top of all this from the beginning. Um, this brings you to the main website for the COVID technical resources, and it's got a variety of things that you can use to uh, really get some more information and drill down and and um, and and you know and, 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 and expand upon some of the stuff that I've talked about. Um, with that, I am um, thank you for your time, and I appreciate it, and I am going to... Um, to the next moderator, next speaker. Great. Thank you, Chris. We really appreciate that view. Very interesting. We'll come back to you. I know we're going to have a lot of questions. Our next speaker is Catherine Bobenhausen from uh, Colden Corporation. She's a senior consultant, but she's an industrial hygienist. So she's going to bring a really uh, important voice to our program today about health and safety. So uh, Catherine, let's turn it over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, 
I'm an industrial hygienist with the Colgan Corporation. We are focused exclusively on occupational safety and health consulting for clients. And um, I am, our program for COVID is led by an epidemiologist. And we have been very busy from the beginning of the pandemic. Um, today, June 10th, we find ourselves at a unique moment in New York State. Yesterday, the governor reported that the rate of vaccination has reached 69.1% in the state, and that once it reaches 70%, the state's restrictive reopening guidance will be lifted. And yet, on Tuesday, the New York State Department of Health issued interim guidance for office space work and for commercial building management, detailing precautions to help protect against the spread of COVID-19 as businesses um, reopen or continue to operate. And as Chris mentioned, you really have to be nimble to stay on top of this guidance that the OH put together is valid during the COVID-19 public health emergency, which may be lifted in New York as early as today. And meanwhile, the governor has on his desk for signature the Health and Essential Rights Act, Hero Act. Once that's signed, it becomes law to take effect 60 days later. The Hero Act requires that the New York State Department of Labor publish model general standards to assist employers in setting up airborne infectious disease exposure prevention plans, which include such things as employee health screenings, face coverings, PPE, hand washing facilities, cleaning and disinfection, effective social distancing, as the risk of illness may warrant. You see how they've gone beyond COVID-19 to airborne infectious diseases in general. Um, precautionary orders of isolation or quarantine is warranted, engineering controls, and provisions related to setting up a joint committee and actions employees are able to take if they believe the employer is not implementing controls adequately. So you see we're kind of going in two different directions simultaneously. So this is an appropriate time to consider the consequences of transitioning indoors and the individual safeguards that may be worth keeping even if state mandates are left. This is really a pivotal moment, and this is kind of a, a very, very critical day. Sorry, next slide. Okay. Um, the good news is that no state is seeing a major increase in COVID-19 cases. While things are looking much better, there are still new cases of COVID-19 occurring every day in the United States, particularly among the unvaccinated. Our unvaccinated colleagues are still at risk. The rate among susceptible unvaccinated people is 73% higher than the national figures. And this came out recently in a, in a Washington Post article. For the unvaccinated, the national death rate is roughly the same as it was two months ago, and the adjusted hospitalization rate is as high as it was three months ago. For them, the CDC precautions are still in place. And what does this mean for building reopening? Some employers are obtaining proof of vaccination status from each employee through paper copies verifying the date and place of vaccination, through access to digital apps or via the state's Excelsior Pass. If vaccination status is unknown, the Department of Health is suggesting social distancing of six feet should be maintained. The DROH is suggesting that in elevators, face coverings and social distancing continue, or they suggest posting signs asking unvaccinated individuals to socially distance and wear masks, or to reserve separate elevators for the vaccinated and unvaccinated. Since there are no masking or social distancing requirements for those employees who have been vaccinated, some employers have concluded that they will lay out the space to keep all the unvaccinated people in a separate area where they can stay masked and socially distanced. But if we closer and vaccinated people together, they are more at risk than if they are each surrounded by vaccinated colleagues and separated from each other. Each person's odds of falling ill depends on the choices of everyone else around them. The more conservative approach to risk is to simply continue to mandate face coverings for everyone when in the building. The New York City Department of Health in their May 21st FAQ on COVID-19 face coverings says, 
even if you're fully vaccinated, our advice is to keep your face covering on indoors until even more people are vaccinated. Right now, inside buildings, New York State City only requires face coverings among the vaccinated when required by a store, restaurant, or public space. At work, if required by an employer, or when around someone who is sick, or in a school, healthcare setting, long term care facility, or homeless shelter. So about half of Americans haven't been vaccinated. And not all who are unvaccinated are hesitant. Some people believe they don't need to be vaccinated since they already have COVID-19. But what they don't account for is that their immunity is short-lived. The data shows that antibodies for infection taper off three to four or up to seven months. The infection doesn't confer long-term immunity. And recovered COVID-19 patients have been reinfected with new strains, particularly evidence in South Africa. In New York State, vaccination sites are moving to zip codes where most unvaccinated people live. So they're starting to be very wise about finding areas. Um, currently, they have been having one or two people show up at vaccination stations that have been set up previously because the market in those areas is saturated. So now they're moving to Brooklyn, to the Bronx, upstate, including Buffalo, where there are very large numbers of people that have been unvaccinated. For many, it's just a lack of access. Some are concerned about how to deal with the after effects of the second dose while needing to be at work. The wait and see camp are most likely to be finally swayed by the growing body of evidence on the effectiveness of the vaccines on the initial virus and on the variants, such as the alpha or B117 variant, common in the United States, and the Delta variant, dominant in the UK and India. Uh, just yesterday, there was a publication in the British Journal saying that the risk of hospitalization is higher in people with the Delta variant, which is apparently rapidly spreading through England schools. Most of these people were admitted to hospital um, not having been vaccinated. So for now, our vaccines are still beating the variants in this country. The longer the virus has to evolve into variants, the less protected we will be, making vaccination progress an urgent public health priority. There are other measures to ensure that COVID-19 transmission is minimized for the building owner or a tenant can do. In this next phase of building reopening, many are moving to self-reporting of symptoms at building entrances. This can be done remotely or when entering the building. Contactless thermal cameras at building entrances can continue to help identify potentially symptomatic visitors so that they can be directed home with instructions to contact the healthcare provider for assessment and testing. This is not in itself a fail-proof way of ensuring that potentially infectious individuals are kept from the building since asymptomatic infectious people may pass through. Nonetheless, the screening may serve as a deterrent to those who know they're sick and consider coming to the office anyway. Some employers have opted for routine testing on employees, and we've done this uh, on some production sets. Uh, we're involved with the entertainment industry, particularly those who have, may have been at elevated risk, or they interact frequently with the public, or just those who are unvaccinated, or those whose trade calls for close work. The intent here is to resolve unknown COVID-19 health status through targeted testing. Depending on the route selected, this requires an administrative framework that can be cumbersome and time consuming to implement. So much attention has been placed on cleaning and disinfection to the point where it's considered hygiene theater rather than an effective means of infection control. The Centers for Disease Control recently modified their guidance, the guidance saying cleaning once a day is generally sufficient and that in many cases cleaning may be enough. It's not necessary to disinfect every surface. And so, you know, why do we disinfect surfaces and buildings anyway? Uh, mostly it's to prevent transfer from, of the virus to our hands because then we touch our face and from then we can become infected. So in the field of infection control among vulnerable populations, really, and you've seen this with surgeries and, and in hospitals generally, hand washing is the best way to prevent infection from touching surfaces, not continual cleaning and disinfection of surfaces. So we've been helping set up targeted plans for pragmatic cleaning and disinfection. 
So I presented several control measures for reducing incidence of COVID-19 in buildings. And as you can see, no single intervention is perfect. Ian McKay, an Australian virologist, famously imagined pandemic defenses as layers of Swiss cheese. Each layer has holes, but when combined, they work to block the virus. In McKay's model, vaccines were the last layer of many. An important layer, as Chris mentioned, is ventilation, air filtration, and the other shared layers are those that I mentioned. So let's be sure that we have reached the end of the pandemic before removing all of the other layers when the New York State vaccination target of 70% is reached. Thank you. I pass this along to Paul. Okay, thank you, uh, Catherine. We uh, appreciate that really fascinating view. Questions are already starting to come in, uh, so you can go to slido.com and use the code UGC uh, to ask your question. You can also uh, upvote uh, questions from others. So our next speaker is uh, Paul Rohde. Uh, he's with Tishman Spire. Um, he's going to uh, bring to us uh, an operational view for how we should think about uh, reopening uh, our offices. So Paul, take it away. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. I will share my screen if I can do this uh, appropriately. Hopefully everyone sees this. There. Okay. So uh, I, I will start by what we're doing here at Tishman Spire across the globe, but, but my comments stay really specific to the U.S. Um, first uh, and foremost, we set up an executive oh, steering committee, and the idea here. behind the committee was to be able to make decisions quickly and informed and to have the uh, decisions implemented in the field. So oh, that we are seeing your notes. Could you please oh, my notes? share your screen again? Yeah, okay, no problem. How is this? Let's see. Are you seeing my notes again? Uh, one more, uh, here, I'll take one more quick spot here. Um, let's see. Uh, you know what? I'll just unshare and share quickly. And maybe that will be good. Oh, I see. Okay. So now we'll do this. And we will... Uh, up and we will share here. Sorry about that, folks. I will move fast there and here. How is that? Oops. How is that? Are we good? Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up. So we set up an executive steering committee. It, 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 it included myself and others uh, from operations and asset management. And we made sure that the committee was provided with uh, on time and current information from sources of truth, CDC, OSHA, ASHRAE, local and state uh, officials, and, and subject matter experts and consultants. And the idea behind this was to establish operational policies and communications and be able to get them out and execute them right away. Uh, our communication methods uh, were, uh, you know, our, our official customer contacts, our tenant contacts, but also we placed the information uh, in our app and on our websites. Uh, because it is updated frequently, we want to be current and we want people to not worry about missing emails. They can always go and find uh, our, our current policies uh, at, at, you know, when they, when they want to see them, not necessarily when we put them out. Uh, we also conducted a series of consulting calls with uh, our tenants. Basically, we have obviously a, a number of large tenants who wanted to calibrate or see what we were doing on the buildings uh, or, or with the shared systems in the buildings. And, and we uh, basically afforded them all the time they needed to consult with us, have, have them hear what we were doing, and coordinate uh, plans. Um, uh, together and then finally, uh, we, you know, we we put the changes in place, and I'll talk about the changes in, in uh, the next slide here. Uh, our our overall program included measures, what we call community measures, which are those portions of our buildings or our sites that uh, see a lot of visitors, see a lot of tourists, and and of course uh, our, our our tenants. 
And so we have we have um, it, you know we've established general community measures, basically avoiding crowds, uh, you know, wearing a mask in confined spaces, wearing a mask in common areas, and we get, we provide tips, um, basically to be or best practices to be to be carried out by folks when they're transiting uh, the larger sites. We also reinforce the personal precautions that should be taken. We do have an we do have an app that asks a series of uh, very simple questions. Do you feel sick? You know, have you been around someone with COVID? If so, consider staying home. Uh, wash your hands frequently. You know, avoid contact to the eyes or mouth if you're if you're touching surfaces. So we reiterated all these. We thought it was a smart thing to do and 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 keep it top of mind for folks. Workplace guidelines are what we're doing in our common spaces and what we recommend. The guidelines basically focus on, on, on lobby etiquette, uh, wearing masks in all our common spaces, uh, watch the crowds. We just recently took our, our, our arrows down from the walls and the windows because it was uh, pretty much self-evident which way you should walk um, in, in all the properties. Uh, we, we also uh, have special guidance around elevators, around restrooms, and, and tight corridors. And we are still limiting uh, folks uh, in terms of uh, our elevator uh, traffic, but uh, we're also monitoring what that's doing to the queues in front of the elevators. And we will probably change those guidelines to reduce the overall contact time that you have uh, with a crowd of people. To, uh, to basically uh, you know, pay attention to the fact that it's contact time and closeness that, that needs to be minimized, not necessarily a hard fixed number of number of people in an elevator. Um, touch point cleaning procedures, we, we, uh, we tell people what we're doing basically, we've doubled and tripled up our, our cleaning of those areas in the building that you have to touch elevator buttons where we don't have destination dispatch and, and, and restroom fixtures. Um, where they're not automatic or sinks. And so we, we, uh, we, we publish uh, what we're doing and how frequently we're doing it. And we also publish it in such a way that people can just cut and paste it into their own procedures for those larger tenants that have, uh, have, have lots of their own infrastructure. On the air side, uh, basically, uh, you know, we carried out the, uh, the, uh, the recommendations which pretty much center around maximizing outside air increasing the filtration that was done across the portfolio on, 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 on all our air handlers and, and our devices, our end device, our, our terminal devices, of course, have lower MERV rated filters that, that really can't, can't, can't be upgraded. Uh, and in those areas, we, we uh, either rec we, we recommend consulting if people are nervous about it, uh, spot filters uh, and, and room deployable filters, you know, uh, that could be, could be used. Um, we also went into depth in, in outlining how people should have their seating arrangements uh, reconfigured if there's concerns about this because most of the cases of, of uh, contagion inside an office building had, had happened uh, from an airflow perspective. Uh, so, so an infected person breathing out and another person next to them breathing that in, not necessarily air recirculated through a system. Not that that shouldn't be paid attention to. And so seating, where people sit is very important. Where air comes out into the space and where it returns into the space should be known. And, and simple decisions can be made once you, you have that down. And then we uh, also published uh, what food services are available in the area because many, many restaurants are closed down. So as people come back, we want them to not have to hunt out uh, where they can get lunch. We're, we're making that available to them. And then as far as planning ahead goes, we intend to hang on to a number of the indoor air quality measures that we've taken. I mean, we basically see the fact that we're pumping a lot of outside air into these buildings is a good thing. And that it will um, basically, you know, conform with better human performance. And so we're, we're, you know, while we've taken on a lot of these COVID items, uh, many of them will, will live well beyond the, the pandemic in the hopes that our buildings are, are um, made to be superior places to work than at home. So that's what I have. And I will pass it off to Federico Garcia Parra uh, in London. Okay, thanks, uh, Paul. Appreciate that operational view. Uh, you mentioned elevators and that's uh, our next topic uh, with Federico Garcia Parra from Otis Elevator Company, who's gonna talk to us about some really interesting research related uh, to ventilation uh, in elevators. Uh, 
Uh, Federico is joining us from London, so uh, welcome to the panel. Federico, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, John, and thank you, co-panelists and the Urban Green Council for organizing this very interesting panel. Uh, I'm the head of Global Strategic Accounts at Otis, and I've been supporting the major corporations since the beginning of the outbreak design their uh, re-entry strategies into the workplace in a, in a healthy and safe manner. So, but, but before I begin, let me give you some numbers. Uh, let me give you some background story about the initiative. As the COVID-19 outbreak started, and, and we talked to our customers around the world, trying to understand what the main concerns and pain points were when they were designing these re-entry strategies into the workplace that I was mentioning. We learned and, and realized that ongoing concerns around the spread of the virus during the elevator ride made many people become hesitant about taking the elevators, riding the elevators. So it was clear our clients were facing a, a real challenge here. And as we heard from some of the panelists uh, earlier today, when we then decided to, uh, to commission Dr. King Chan Chan from Purdue University in the US to study with three main objectives. The first one would be to help the industry better understand how airflow affects the risk of exposure among passengers in and around the elevator Second, to mitigate those risks through recommended science-based safety protocols. And finally, to provide additional scientific support on how the various air quality products we're offering affect the risk of transmission of virus among passengers. But we go, without going too much in, into details, since I'm going to be coming in a minute, we can confirm that the findings uh, were positive and encouraging. As a first step, uh, we understood that we needed a framework, a framework to define relative risk of exposure and a way to compare different types of activities. The scientific underpinning behind that is the combination of three factors. One is intensity, second is frequency, and then the duration of the exposure. With all these questions and all the research we did, we knew that we needed to focus on airflow and urban transmission. And if this is what led us to study the details of airflow in elevators. Although one of the smaller spaces in the building Elevators may be one of the fast, safest, thanks to their general operations systems, but also the design uh, requirements. Most of the elevator system is behind the wall and keeps you safe in a way that passengers may never see or think about. For example, what the general public might not realize is that elevators are not just closed boxes with no air circulation, and that by code, openings for ventilations are required for all elevators. The average cup ride is below two minutes, and this includes rides in high, high rise buildings. But if we go there and consider rides in residential buildings, these are on average below one minute. So hence, making the exposure time minimal. There's also a high level of air exchange that lowers the risk of exposure to the virus. So recognizing that every elevator ride in scenario is different, the study examined a subset of variables that are important to the movement of people, air, and elevators. We wanted to look at how ventilation rate and type, cap configuration, air purification, and max uses can affect the risk. But we also wanted to compare the relative risk of exposure to what we know about spending time in common spaces. So we did is we set out to answer questions around how do mitigation strategies impact safety and how using elevators compared to other situations we find ourselves in. So what did we did to crack this nut we adopted computational fluid dynamics uh, modeling techniques. The study also examined the relative risk in common spaces and of typical activities associated with office work. The focus was on the risk tied to airflow, with air exchange identified as a key factor. When considering relative risk, the study found that elevator ride is comparable to a short time in an office or a bus. However, when you consider the longer average duration in a bus or an office relative to an elevator ride, we see significantly less relative risk in an elevator. Another finding was that the higher the ventilation rate was, or in other words, the higher the elevator fan speed, the lower of the accumulated dose could be. Accumulated dose quantifies the relative risk of transmission. So there's some variation of accumulated dose, between racks I mean the relative risk, in deeper, narrower cups, depending on the duration and position of the rider. So as a background, 
the 350 CFM, the higher fan speed, is typical for mid and high rise elevators. And the 55 CFM is typical for low rise elevators with only a, a couple of, uh, of stops. So while the results show elevators to be relatively safe by design and operation, intervention methods can reduce this risk even further. And what is this? Well, like you know, the use of proper mask can cut the risk in half or the use of needle point bipolar ionization as a filtration station a strategy can reduce the risk between 20 and 30%. And finally, the combined, the two combined can reduce the relative risk exposure by 60 to 65%. In addition to these quantitative results that I just showed, qualitative, qualitative comparisons can give us a better sense of the relative risk of riding in, in an elevator. Making quantitative comparisons to many different scenarios is actually difficult. But even in controlled computer simulations, there can be a lot of variables and both the natural and inbuilt environment has a lot of variation, especially when combined with human behavior. Still, with what we've learned, we can place riding in an elevator in a low risk, generally safe category, along with activities, including outdoor exercise or getting takeout from a restaurant or a grocery shopping. In summary, many people outside our industry don't realize that elevators are required by code to have openings for ventilation. So there's a lot of air exchange already in the design of an elevator, and that in turn reduces the number of airborne particles in the cab. Elevator rides are short, usually less than two minutes, so there is a real limit to the exposure. Then, if we couple what we already know about the elevator design and operation, the study findings support the idea that elevator travel is a relatively low risk activity. And with the right mitigation strategies and intervention methods, the risk can be reduced even further. So, we could say that an elevator ride is safer than dining at a restaurant. And with this, I pass it to John to open the discussion. Thank you. Okay, Federico, thank you. Um, let's start with questions uh, for you, Federico. This research is fascinating. Um, how is it going to influence the future of elevator design? Oh, thank you. Very good question. Thank you, John. We've already started uh, to use the results of the study to not only make recommendations for existing elevators, but also to improve new elevators as well. What we're doing is we're trying to incorporate the latest research into all the work that we're doing, John. Got it. And, and Catherine, the, the question I was thinking about while you were speaking is, um, in, in your view, how, how are building owners going to know when to drop the mask mandate? I mean, I think people, you know, there's CDC guidance and then there's individual building policy, which is to be respected. But it seems like at what, what's the moment where we think uh, people will feel comfortable dropping a mask mandate inside the building? Well, first you have to comply with the regulatory mandates, right? But the second is um, it's very uh, location-specific. And so one of the things that one would do is look at the community. Um, and also the risk tolerance of the people that are working. We, we work with a wide variety of clients, um, and some are happy meeting the minimum requirements of, uh, by the regulations, and others want to take a more So it's part of an overall risk management strategy for the organization as a whole. Thank you. We have a lot of questions coming into uh, the app. Remember, you can go to slido.com with the code UGC to ask your questions, and you can vote up the questions that, uh, that you like the most. Um, Paul, to you, um, you know, how do you get buy-in from your team to, re to support the opening reopening measures? Um, you know, what's it take to, to mobilize, to get the operations in the right place 
uh, to make it successful? Well, it's, it, it's a mission, okay, and it starts with uh, providing uh, the information, the engineering information, the background, the, the, the basically the data on why we're doing what we're doing, reminding people that we are here to provide, uh, you know, basically a superior environment for the tenants, and in order to do that, this is what we need to do. So it's uh, almost like a military operation, frankly. So, so my buy-in, I mean, quite, quite frankly, what, yeah, you know, buy-in, you, know, um, you know, here are the orders. This is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. Get it done. That, that is pretty much the approach. Good. And Chris, uh, when you were speaking, I was thinking, um, you know, when we get back to normal, whatever that is, what interventions do you think are going to stay uh, from, from your perspective? And then what ones do you think won't be needed? I think the additional filtering is definitely going to stay. Um, the building being more buildings being more flexible, we're bringing in as much outside air as they can when it's energy efficient and it's the right time of season. Where in the past everybody has thought blanket, let's let's just curb the outside air as little as possible so that we can save as much energy. Energy savings is great, but I think it, there'll be a balance point with um, air. I also think the use of um, local filtration and dense, more dense areas will probably have some measure because I think that things are going to um, cycle, you know, cycle back and, and really stay around. Um, the, the, the concern that I have is the um, widespread extra use of energy because of all this and, 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 and what's going to be looked at from that standpoint. And, and it, that'll, that'll be used to figure out what measures are going to stay because energy is cost and money, you know, it's money. And um, a lot of building owners and pull notes um, really take a, they, you know, need to need to be cognizant of that. And so, and, and it's a balancing point. Maybe, but I'm happy that there's more outside air. Yeah, I maybe a that follow that, on to that though. So if, if more energy is needed to run the ventilation properly, you know, where, where can a building go to offset that someplace else? Well, they can put more energy recovery yeah. systems in they can, oh, I'm sorry, Paul, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say we could, we would, and that's exactly what we're looking into. We would put more energy recovery is the answer to that. Great. Um, let's go to the audience questions. There's a lot of them coming in here. I'm reading them here off of the uh, iPad. So here's one for Catherine that got voted up. Um, is there any intelligence on what the flu season might bring and how it relates to COVID? We're just getting into summer. I hate to be thinking about the flu season, but let's, let's plan ahead a little bit. We do believe that things are going to start to uptick in the fall, and especially you know in the October, November area for the flu season, for the flu and possibly COVID. Do we think though that the that the measures that buildings have taken and that will stay will have uh, a, a positive impact on reducing just the normal flu over time and help boost office productivity because less people are sick? Um, well, I think part of the reason that we had such a great um, track record with the flu was because people were masking, right? And so when the masks come off, people come back into the offices. Um, I think that we're going to see a resurgence. Back to can I take a, uh, I hate to put my panel on the spot, but maybe by a, a show of hands, um, post-COVID flu season, who would wear a mask in, in public just to prevent themselves from getting the flu? Can you raise your hand? I, I think it depends on, depends on where I am. Public transportation, possibly, yes. You know, it's the density of the area and knowing how ventilation systems work and where there's minimal ventilation in certain areas or research and I, I think I would consider it. I've heard um, a number of comments from colleagues and everything that people, mask wearing is going to be more prevalent and whereas it was it, it was considered something wrong in the past, now it's going to be commonplace depending upon the, I think at least depending upon the season. Catherine, I, I, anyway. Which is actually what things, you know, this is the behavior there that you've been seeing in places like uh, Hong Kong on Asia Pacific after SARS, right? People yeah. got used to it, and that's why they're more prepared yep. here now. And they've been using masks right after the SARS was over, right? You know, as a precautionary measure. 
Yeah. And I also think everybody just bought a ton of masks, so they're <laughs> keep <laughs> using <laughs> the ROI. But, but I also think that there's a psychological effect. Like if you find that you're wearing a mask and you're not getting common colds anymore, and maybe even it's helping your allergies a little bit, people will psychologically go, hey, this works. And, you know, so I, I think that there'll be a fold in, you know, it, it bothers um, uh, some people like uh, glasses. I tried all kinds of masks and everything on my glasses still fog up. And, you know, so so there, there's some uncomfort with it. But I think that there's there's some overall benefits, uh, in my opinion. So. Great. Here's another question. Um, you know, are you seeing any new trends on how spaces will be utilized post COVID? Anybody wants to take that? Maybe Paul from starting with from your perspective? Well, I mean, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, there's where you know, I think we will see that uh, flexibility and seating flexibility and design of the space uh, to handle, um, you know, various shift, shifts uh, changing, uh, more, more common collaboration space, but better, better uh, thought out. I, I, I mean, I'm seeing more flex right now. I, yeah. I don't know if that's a result of COVID or a result of just the, the carry over from uh, the, the co-working uh, learnings, but uh, I, I'm seeing that. A, a more awareness and airflows, by the way, in spaces too. I mean, certainly with yeah. us. We've um, had a lot of people ask about indoor air quality monitoring, whereas before it was deemed too expensive. I also think that the hoteling is going to take hold finally, and more companies will be doing flex and hoteling, and you'll be able to spread people out more. Definitely spreading people out less dense, checkerboard with the desks, things like that, um, and and the cafe areas spread out a lot more. We're seeing that where, where they're not um, trying to get everybody densed in, and also timing. I think sequence timing of when dense populations are going to occupy certain areas. And, and, and it'll be more of a, uh, you know, like a controlled effort, I think. Yeah, and I think also that this will impact the future, you know, when you're designing the, the buildings in the future, for, to bear in mind two things. First, flexibility yeah. in that design, and second, future-proofing of the building, right? Yeah. And also, in order to accommodate to different um, peaks of density, uh, also use the in, in data and big data in order to accommodate that, too, yeah. and, and IoT. Well, CFD modeling. You mentioned CFD modeling. We are using CFD modeling not only for thermal modeling, but also for ventilation modeling and looking at spaces ventilation-wise and where the air is coming in, where it's going out, and the, and the traffic patterns of the air, I think it's going to become way more prevalent and, and commonplace and um, used for not just specialty areas anymore because people are going to want to know what's going on in these spaces. So. You know, we're all, we're all fixated on the numbers, right? So we had 10% office occupancy in January. Today it's 20 on its way to 30. But it's, yeah. it's interesting, the kind of pre-COVID average office occupancy number was a lot different than what I expected. Uh, from one owner I spoke to, it was 53%. Uh, people mm -hmm. on travel, uh, people uh, paid time off on vacation, uh, people on sick days or, or, or days home uh, watching children, working from home. Um, and so that was an eye opener to me. I don't know if that's a, a, the experience of the panel on what kind of the normal occupancy of an office is. Mm -hmm. I, well, I, I see, it to, to me, it really depends on what the business is doing. We've walked through space, you know, I, I, if, it, if it's a law firm, typically they're dense packed it in. Advertising firms may have very variable occupancy. I don't know, Paul, maybe you can comment a little more, but I think it really depends on the business. You know, it, it, Building by building, the buildings tend yeah. to be able at a certain number of people per square feet, but, but uh, I, I can't say that there's a wholesale rule. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for uh, one more question here. Let me pull it up. Um, Federico, for you, talk to us about the, the, the ventilation rates uh, from, from the research. Um, you know, can every elevator meet those ventilation rates? Um, and, 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 you know, what, what's the purification that you think is needed inside the elevator cab? Okay. So, yes, uh, a quick question to that, uh, in John, is yes, that... Uh, that uh, every elevator can reach that the level of, vent uh, of ventilation that I've been showing in, in the study, right? And uh, again, with the numbers that I was giving you, the average uh, um, 
air fans uh, speeds, right? And with the mitigation strike that I was showing, it would be you know, enough to, to, to bring the, 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 the risk, the already uh, risk that is in a low risk category to a much lower one. So with those two variables, I think it's, uh, it, it would be enough. Great. Well, we're at the top of the hour already, so I want to thank uh, our distinguished global panel, Chris McHugh from AKF, Catherine Bobenhausen from Colden, Paul Rohde from Tishman Spire, and Federico Garcia Parra from Otis. Thank you for uh, sharing uh, your views on this very timely topic uh, on how we proceed with office reopenings in New York City. Uh, thank you for joining the Thanks. program. We want to uh, call your attention to uh, a major event we have coming up, um, which is our annual conference um, on June 23rd. Uh, our conference this uh, year is going to explore climate, health, and equity, no more false choices, and how we can design policies and buildings that achieve the outcomes that we want for climate, health, and equity together. Uh, without compromise choices. It's going to be a fantastic conference. I hope you'll join us. Thank you again uh, to our panel. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, thank you for joining us for our inaugural run of Studio Urban Green. Uh, we hope to see you on a future program. Everybody stay safe. Have a great day. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. Thanks, John.